I do not remember this momentous occasion as a child. Maybe because I was only five years old, but also because it wasn't a topic that dominated conversation in our home. The early 1980s was dominated by the, ex the, by the escalation of militancy in the North into a full-scale civil war that was to mar the next 30 years. The terrible race riots of 1983 and a bloody communist insurgency amongst the youth was to darken my memories of my childhood and the lives of all Sri Lankans. I recollect now the race riots of 1983 with horror. But for the simple imagination of a child not yet six, it was a time of extended play and fun. I do not say this lightly, as about 35 of our closest friends, all Tamils, took shelter in our home. They needed sanctuary from vicious, politically motivated goon squads, and my father, like many other Sri Lankans from different ethnic backgrounds, opened their houses at great personal risk. For me, though, it was a time where I had all my friends to play with all day long. The schools were closed, and we played sport for hour after hour in the backyard. Cricket, football, rounders, it was a child's dream come true. I remember getting annoyed when a game would be rudely interrupted by my parents, and we'd all be ushered inside, hidden upstairs with our friends, and ordered to be silent as the goon squads started searching homes in our neighborhood. I did not realize the terrible consequences of my friends being discovered, and my father reminded me the other day of how one day, during that period, I turned to him and in all innocence said, I hope this happens every year, because it's so much fun having my friends to play with every day. The JVP-led communist insurgency rising out of our universities was equally horrific in the late 1980s. Schools and universities were closed. People rarely stepped out of their homes in the evenings. The sight of charred bodies on the roadsides and floating corpses in the river was terrifyingly commonplace. People who defied the JVP faced dire consequences. They even urged students of all schools to walk out and march in support of their aims. I was fortunate to be at Trinity College, one of the few schools that defied their dictates. Yet I was living just below Dharmaraja College in Kandy, where the students who walked out of its gates were met with tear gas, and I would see students running down the hill to wash their eyes out with water from a garden tap. My first cricket coach, Mr. D.H. De Silva, a wonderful human being who coached tennis and cricket to students free of charge, was shot on the tennis court by insurgents. Despite being hit in the abdomen twice, he miraculously survived when the gun held to his head jammed. Like many during and after that period, he fled overseas and started a new life in Australia. As the decade progressed, the fighting in the north and east had heightened to a full-scale war. The Sri Lankan government was fighting the terrorist LTTE in a war that would drag our country's development back by decades. This war affected the whole of our land in different ways. Families, usually from the lower economic classes, sacrificed their young women and men by the thousands in the service of Sri Lanka's military. Even Colombo, a commercial capital that seemed far removed from the war's front line was under siege by terrorists using powerful vehicle and suicide bombs. Bombs in public places targeting both civilians and political targets became an accepted risk of daily life in Sri Lanka. Parents traveling to work by bus would split up and travel separately so that if one of them died, the other would return home to tend to the family. Each and every Sri Lankan was touched by the brutality of that conflict. People were disillusioned with politics and power and war. They were fearful of an uncertain future. The cycle of violence seemed unending. And Sri Lanka became famous internationally for its war and conflict. It was a bleak time where we as a nation looked 
for inspiration. A miracle that would lift the pallid gloom and show us what we as a country were capable of, if united as one. A beacon of hope to illuminate the potential of our peoples. That inspiration was to come in 1996. The pre-1995 era, during which Sri Lanka produced many fine cricketers, but struggled to break free from the old colonial influences that had indoctrinated the way the game was played in Sri Lanka. Even after gaining test status in 1981, Sri Lanka's cricket suffered from an identity crisis, and there was far too little Sri Lankan in the way we played our cricket. Although there were exceptions, one being the much talked about Sata Sivam, who was a flamboyant and colorful cricketer both on and off the field. He was a cricketer in whose hand they say the bat was like a magic wand. Another unique batsman was Dulip Mendes, now a chief selector, who batted with, swashbuck with swashbuckling bravado. Generally, though, we played cricket by the book, copying the orthodox and conservative styles of the traditional cricketing powerhouses. There was none of the live for the moment and happy-go-lucky attitudes that underpin our own identity. We had a competitive team with able players, but we were timid, soft, and did not yet fully believe in our own worth as individual players or as a team. I guess we were in many ways like the early West Indian teams, Calypso cricketers who played the game as entertainers and lost more often than not, albeit gracefully. What we needed at the time was a leader, a cricketer from the masses who had the character, the ability, and above all, the courage and the goal to change a system, to stand in the face of unfavorable culture and tradition, unafraid to put himself on the line for the achievement of a greater cause. This much-awaited messiah arrived in the form of an immensely talented and slightly rotund, <laughs> Arjuna Ranatunga. He was to change the entire history of our cricketing heritage, converting the game that we loved into a shared fanatical passion that over 20 million people embraced <clears throat> as their own personal dream. The leadership of Arjuna during this period was critical to our emergence as a global force. It was Arjuna who understood most clearly why we needed to break free from the shackles of our colonial past and forge a new identity. An identity forged exclusively from Sri Lankan values, an identity that fed from the passion, vibrance, and emotions of normal Sri Lankans. Arjuna was a man hell-bent on making his own mark on the game in Sri Lanka determined to break from foreign tradition and create a new national brand of cricket. Coming from Ananda College to the SSC proved to be a culture shock for him. SSC, or the Sinhalese Sports Club, was dominated by students from St. Thomas's and Royal College, the two most elite schools in Colombo. The club's committee, membership, and even the composition of the team was dominated by these schools. Arjuna himself has spoken about how alien the culture felt and how difficult it was for him to adjust to try and fit in. As a 15-year-old kid practicing in the nets at the club, a senior stalwart of the club inquired about him. When told he was from the unfashionable Ananda College, he dismissed his talents immediately. We don't want any sarong johnnies in this club. As it turned out, Arjuna not only went on to captain SSC for many years, he also went on to break the stranglehold the elite schools had on the game. His goal was to impart in the team self-belief, to give us a backbone and a sense of self-worth that would inspire the team to look the opposition in the eye and stand equal, to compete without self-doubt or fear to defy unhealthy traditions and to embrace our own Sri Lankan identity. He led fearlessly with unquestioned authority, but in a calm and collected manner that earned him the tag, Captain Cool. 
the first and most important foundation for our charge towards 1996 was laid. In this slightly overweight and unfit South Pole, Sri Lanka had a brilliant general who for the first time looked to all available corners of our country to pick and choose his troops. Arjuna better than anyone at the time realized that we needed an edge. And in that regard, he searched for players whose talents were so unique that when refined, they would mystify and destroy the opposition. In cricket, timing is everything. This proved to be true for the Sri Lankan team as well. We as a nation must be ever so thankful to the parents of Sanajaya Surya and Mutaya Murlidharan for having sired these two legends to serve our cricket at its greatest time of need. From Mathura came Sanath, a man from a humble background, with an immense talent that was raw and without direction or refinement. A talent under the guidance of Arjuna that was to be harnessed to become one of the most destructive batting forces the game has ever known. It was talent never seen before, and now with his retirement, never to be seen again. Murali came from the hills of Kandy, from a more affluent background. Starting off as a fast bowler and later changing to spin, he was blessed with a natural deformity in his bowling arm, allowing him to impart so much spin on the ball that it spun at unthinkable angles. He brought wrist spin to off spin. There is a story that in the early 1990s, Alan Border, having faced him, walked back to the Australian dressing room and said, he's a leg spinner, but he bowls a lot of googlies. <laughs> Arjuna's team was now in place, and it was an impressive pool of talent. But they were not yet a team. Although winning the 1996 World Cup was a long-term goal, they needed to find a rallying point, a uniting factor that gave them a sense of team a cause to fight for, an event that, not will, that will not only bind the team together, giving them a common focus, but also rally the entire support of a nation for the team and its journey. This came on Boxing Day at the MCG in 1995. Few realized it at the time, but the no-balling of Murali for alleged chucking had far-reaching consequences. The issue raised the ire of an entire nation. Murali was no longer alone. His pain, embarrassment, and anger were shared by all. No matter what critics say, the manner in which Arjuna and the team stood behind Murali made an entire Sri Lankan nation proud. In that moment, Sri Lanka adopted the cricketers simply as Ape Kollo, which means our boys. Gone was the earlier detachment of the Sri Lankan cricket fan, and in its place was a newfound love for those 15 men. They became our sons, our brothers. Sri Lankans stood with them and shared their trials and tribulations. The decision to no-ball Murali in Melbourne was for all Sri Lankans an, Ill, an, an insult that would not be allowed to pass unavenged. It was the catalyst that spurred the Sri Lankan team on to do the unthinkable, become world champions just 14 years after obtaining full ICC status. It is also important to mention here that prior to 1981, more than 80% of the national players came from elite English schools. But by 1996, the same schools did not contribute a single player to the 1996 World Cup winning squad.